No, that, that, I call it the carpet dress, Act 2 dress in Wicked. They actually do this thing where they sew in ice packs. Um, no to, way. I watched a bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. So basically, no is your answer to your question, because I have I didn't get Frozen, which is, there's, there's, that's an exclusive for you. Like, would you? Would you all do it? And of course, we're all like, yeah. I have forgotten everything apart from me and the sky. Oh my God, it's unreal. It's, un it's unbelievable. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Full on, guys, full on. <laughs> you look radiant, my dear. Oh, it's effort, darling. It takes a long time. <laughs> I've got this new hair thing, so I did my hair today to try it out. And it's you did that thing it. at the beginning of lockdown where you didn't wash it for... Yeah. So how was that? So what, so what we do now, so what I do now is I don't do... Um, I do wash it, but I wash it about once a week. Um, and I wash it with um, non-silicon based shampoo and sulfite based shampoo and conditioner. So it's like taking all the crap out of it, essentially. Um, so that really That's just, great. yeah, it's so, yeah, it, it, it's so, so much better. It's, and like, if, I mean, obviously we're coming out of lockdown now, so it's not ideal, but um, it was so, it was so good to do. And my hair, I mean, it hasn't been cut and dyed in, well, since June. So it's horrendous and it's so long. But yeah, so I've just bought this new curling thing and I was like, I'll try it out. And it's nice. It's giving me a lovely little lovely. Like, wave. Lovely little wave. <laughs> yeah. Got to keep doing something because I look so terrible on a day to day basis. So, you know, any moment that someone says you've got, you know, you've got to go online, I'm like, yeah, makeup, face, lip. <laughs> what are you doing, though? <laughs> um uh no darling trying for you you know gonna try well you know have you got your vitamin c there no it's a lime and tonic water okay so not a mojito no i thought about it and then i thought i'll be on the floor i've got two more meetings after this and i was like no if you start drinking the first one you're going to be a mess by the third you're not even going to remember what they say <laughs> have you even had a rest during this entire lockdown it's the first lockdown. Yeah. A bit. I think because it was so sudden and sort of like um unexpected. So yeah, unexpected. I suppose people sort of tried to clamber together little bits and pieces, but it wasn't much, you know what I mean? So um but yeah, I, I think the first one I remember lots of sitting outside and doing the occasional singing lesson, but then when everyone sort of went, okay, we're in like, you know, so, you know, social media, bill, we need to do things online, streaming, blah, blah, blah. I think everyone, I think then it became like, right, my diary is full of things that I'm planning, that I've been asked to do. And um, so, yeah, so it became, I think, quite busy because of that, you know. Um, and also lots of like, um, like teaching, I do privately anyway, but obviously colleges were trying to like keep up because obviously they were all online and they were like, gosh, we need to make sure that they are interested in remaining online, these poor students. So then I sort of got loads of teaching online for colleges as well as my own private students. So, um, you know, so, and I'm just that kind of, I'm that person that just doesn't say no. I don't. Just a girl that can't say no. Yes, darling, as the song goes. Yeah, I just, I, you know, if someone says, will you do this? I'll go, yeah, sure. You know, so it just, and it just piles up. So if you don't sort of, I did have one, yeah. I think at the beginning of lockdown, I think I went, right, well, I might as well embrace it. And the weather was nice. Do you remember how nice the weather yeah. was? Yeah, so, so nice. So we were like, right, well, let's do the garden then. We've been given some time. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Well, I was thinking back to when you left Wicked and it was horrendous, the weather then. Well, it was so, so hot. Do you remember? Oh, my God. Yeah, all I can, I can wait to leave just because, like, I was, good luck. Do you know what I mean? Like, good luck in this. I'm literally with, melting. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, just enjoy it. You know, I couldn't wait. Because I had, like, like two and a half years of it as well. Like, yeah. get, I'm doing it in heat waves. And it's just, like, it's, you know, it's tiring anyway. And then you add in, th I mean, some there were some times where the humidity on stage was, like, 77%. Yeah. And you were, like, and, and I, I would just stand there look, and I would just look at people. If I wasn't looking at the audience, if I could turn away, I'd just look at them with like these puppy eyes, like someone help me, like rescue me from this pain. So, um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, to, to go just to get myself some respite from, from that because it was, you know, that, that, I call it the carpet dress, act two dress in Wicked, is, is 
I call it, I'm just wearing my carpet dress because it was just, it's thick, it's like absolutely thick as anything. And um, and you've got 14, you know, sets of tights and undergarments on top of this, the, uh, underneath this carpet dress. So um, we actually, they actually do this thing where they sew in ice packs. Um, no to, way. Yeah, because you're, because you can't, you haven't really got time. You don't sit down, you know, have like a song off. Yeah. You're either doing so, so you haven't got time to cool down or even like unzip for 20 seconds. You haven't ever got that time. So they, I ended up saying, we're going to have to do something because it's literally 30 degrees for like three weeks. I need, you need to help me here. And so we were like, okay, let's maybe sew some ice packs in so that you're just cool, cool the whole time. And they do work for a bit, but of course, you know, you take them off and you basically, you've got a hot water bottle because I'm that, I was literally like <laughs> sweating that much. Um, yeah, the memories. Actually, someone posted a video the other day of, um, Oh, it was Carl Mann. He posted a video of uh, of the bows at one point, uh, and he had been on, and uh, he tagged me in it. And I went, "Oh, lovely memories! How lovely!" And he just went, "Yeah, that that day it was really hot. Do you remember?" And if you watch when I'm walking off, we all start waving, and I'm literally going like this, <laughs> just like trying to dry my face in any way I possibly can. And I was like, "Yeah, actually, I do remember it. Very real. Yes, it's <laughs> right there. That memory." But the videos are beautiful of, the, of your final bow and all the speeches. Because I didn't realise so many people leave at any one point. I mean, it, it stands to reason because you'll you'll start the job at the same time. And... Yeah, we'd had a big cast change. It doesn't always work out like that, but we'd had a big cast change. Um, and we had all started together. And I think there was only one... Paolo was there for was five that... years, wasn't he? Yeah, and we had lots. Of, yeah, but I think, but um, it, it was it was a quite a big one, and very much for the principals as well. Like pretty much every principal went that year that we yeah. went, uh, bar Andy Hockley. That was the only one that wasn't going anywhere, and um, so it ended up, you know, being quite. That's quite an emotional thing when you're, you know, you know that you're all going, um, and it makes it, you know, such a sort of even bigger deal than it is anyway. Um, and being the parts they are and having the two years that we'd had, we just loved it. And we've become so close. And, you know, I, I, I was so pleased in the way that me and Sophie were leave, you know, joined together and were leaving together. You know, I felt, oh, it's, it's ours. Our version is ours. And we can't, we, it's, we'll ever, you know, no one else will, won't do it with anyone else. And so it was a really, you know, it's just a really big, painful night when I, when I look back. Um, loved it uh, you know I, you know it was but it, I felt I remember the morning of that day that final day and I felt sick I felt like I couldn't eat a, I couldn't eat anything I felt like I was going to throw up all day um and and you find what you're going in the show but like the warm-ups and everything and I just was like oh no I'm going to throw up and then people start bringing you gifts the first person that that brought me a gift that day um and I was I was kind of fine I felt sick but I felt I was like I'm not crying it's fine and um, it was actually Sam who was first cover Glinda. She brought me a gift. <laughs> and it was like this lovely piece of artwork with all the um, song titles as, as the artwork kind of thing. So all this like lyrics and stuff made this piece, made this um, Elphaba statue. And well, I just, I, she, I she handed it and she went, just want to give this to you to say thank you. You've always been so supportive. And I just went, you need to leave. You need to leave right now. You need to leave. Um, and I was like, sorry, I'm being hard for you to go because I was fine until you walked into this room. And um, and yeah, so I, so I remember that was the, the, the turning point to where I, I became slightly teary all day. Um, the afternoon was fun because it's always quite a fun show. But but the evening, just when you know it's the last time you're going to sing something, the last time you're going to do something. Um, yeah, there's no feeling like it really. But yeah, it was. I think it was a huge cast change. And I, I, I like that because I felt like it was very much ours. We sort of didn't yeah. share it with anyone else. Um, and there's always, there's something nice about that. And to look back at that point now, like obviously that was in July, wasn't it? And then by March we were plunged into this craziness. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was odd. Of course, leaving, you know, I mean, I, I had the inevitable because I was like really sick when I left with it. That inevitable kind of like end of contract kind of you know like bed bound for three weeks and then yeah within six months I mean I, I was doing loads and having such a great time and having you know getting some evenings back and sort of then I got my you know I got come from away and you know so that that six months that followed Wicked were really entertaining in my career because they were so varied suddenly having done the same show for 
three years every night I was now doing loads of different gigs loads of different appearances loads of different workshops um and so it was really really interesting loads of different auditions um then getting a new job so it was a really exciting six months and then we obviously January came we started coming from away um and yeah so what within two two and a bit months from starting the day I started coming from away the, the yeah the world became what went to a standstill because of the virus and um and I suppose I mean you look I, I sort of I, I almost feel like that was 100 years ago that I finished working now because we've been through so much um I should have finished come from away by now that's that that's how long the virus has gone on we would have finished our contracts at the end of February um so we've we've missed an entire basically an entire contract of work and, and of the, that show and so I suppose uh, yeah it's, it's been a it's funny and I feel I just feel sorry for, for I feel sorry for everyone that we can't do what we do really it's it's but you know it's um there's you know hopefully there's some light now and we can see the end of it but it does feel the I think because of the because of the pandemic as well it does feel like it was another lifetime that I did with it. But then, yeah so talking about auditions and things that you you've been up for because so I think it was Anne Hathaway talked about how she was seventh in line for yeah, Devil Wears um, Prada, Devil which Wears shocked Prada. the world. And I know you've said yourself, you've probably been in about 50 finals for different oh. shows. Are there any shows that people might be surprised to hear that you were? Uh, Love Never Dies was a big one that I never yeah. got. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, semi-thankful I didn't now, obviously, in the, in the long run. Um, but yeah, that was that was one I never got. God, oh my God, there's so many. I didn't get Frozen, which is there's, there's, that's an exclusive for you. I didn't get that. Yeah. I love the sound got, got that. That's okay. I live. I live. I move on. Um, uh, but you know, you don't mind it. Oh, oh, Legally Blonde. I didn't get Legally Blonde like twice. Um, I was up for Vivian, and I I really wanted Vivian because it's basically it is me. Yeah. That's just really like I would have just nailed it, and I never got the chance to do it. Um, so yeah, so it was. So I never got legally blonde. What else have I been up for? That like, I've just you know just never. Got, I just every. I've probably been up for everything and just like not got it. And then just luckily the ones that you all know are the ones I got. Um, but even within that, so you for Glinda was five times you went for alphabet. Yeah. So sorry. Whenever I was available, so if I wasn't in the show, I was up for Wicked. Yeah. And and if I was up for Wicked, I made it to the final. Um, but the first couple of times, I was up for Nessa Rose and Elphaba. And I actually wanted to be seen for Glinda as well, but they just would not see it. They just didn't They didn't jump on that bandwagon at all. Because I was a soprano. Like, in my early career, yeah, I was yeah. a soprano. Um, and I was like, I can really do I, I'm really funny. Like, I'd done Princess Fiona. And they were like, no, we just don't see it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, and so early doors, I was it was Nessa Rose and Alphaba, and Nessa they kind of pushed Nessa Rose originally. Um, and you have to do like movement core when you're up for like the un the ensemble and the tracks and stuff that I was up for originally. And then I think it was about the third time I went up for it was when I was up for standby, um, and I didn't get that twice. One time was because someone was staying. The second time was because someone got it over me. Uh, or other way around, I can't remember. Um, and then when the fifth time came up, uh, it was the 10th anniversary, and they said, you know, my agent called and said, so they want, they want you back in for Wicked. Uh, they know that you've been through it, the rigmarole of it. So it, it's really, you're just coming in for the workshop phase, which is basically like a, you just go in, you just do the material one more time, know where you're meant to look, blah, 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 for the camera, etc. And then you can go to your final. So it's not, you don't have to do more than two rounds. It's literally workshop and final. And I was like, well, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get, I don't get this job. It's going to be the job I don't get. So, um, and I said to myself, okay, well, it's the fifth time, fifth and last. That's what I'd sort of, I went, I won't do it again. Um, and I mean, when I went in for my workshop, I knew the panel so well by that point that we basically just had a chat for 40 minutes. We just yeah. sat down and just, you know, because they knew I knew them. They knew that I knew the material, and they knew that I what I did and how I did it. And they were just like, "Yeah, just take in," <laughs> you know. And um, 
and so yeah and so, so it was quite a nice day and it was the most relaxed I've ever been in audition which you know shows you what you should the more relaxed you are the better you maybe are in auditions but because I was so like well I'm not going to get it so what's you know there's no point stressing out about this job um but of course I didn't realize that I was their first choice for standby and uh and I had wanted the part, but they had said, no, it's already, it's, it's gone to someone that's played it previously. And I was like, well, that's fine. I can't fight that. I kind of knew it was Rachel at that point because yeah. it was a 10th anniversary. And I thought they're probably going to bring Rachel back. Um, so I was like, standby is good. But then that, I don't mind, I don't mind it. Even though I wanted the part. And I just, I couldn't believe it when I, when I got it, I just went, no, you've got to be making it up. Are you sure? And my agent was like, yes, I'm sure. I was like, can I have it in writing? I need I need to look at it to because I don't believe you because I've never got this job. And in the end, it was actually one of the producers who I know quite well from years gone by, who ended up calling me and went, yes, you have got it, just so you know. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> so I was on tour with Russell Watson at the time um, uh, as his guest vocalist. So I was all around the country, just like, you know, running back and forth to these auditions and, um, so I was like, oh gosh, that, you know, finally, it's it actually happened for me. Then of course the panic sets in and you go, God, can I actually do it? Because it's a really big thing. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> you know. was about this. Did you ever like, obviously when you're preparing for that role, as well as everything else you've got to do, those riffs, and everybody's is so distinctive to their own. Were you secretly yeah, kind of like working out how you were going to make yours? No, like, listen, you know, I didn't do riffs until like well into the run, you know, because you, I just, you know, you just did the, because you didn't know what you, if you could do it or not. And then obviously your voice gets kind of used to it. If you sing it right, you know, technically well, and then you, you know, and you're not stressed, doesn't, doesn't stress you out, which it didn't for me, amazingly. Um, you know, I just started to try stuff out because when, especially when you're in, you know, you're 600 shows down the line, you know. Um, and I, there was one that Willem, Willemine used to do and I really wanted to be able to do that and so I would test myself and see, you know I'd just copy other people's riffs and and then eventually you sort of do your own but I mean I, I did them like it, everyone says that I sort of do them all the time and I basically did them once in a blue moon um but that was the one that got recorded and got put on you know the old YouTube so it sounds like I did them every night but um but no I was pretty I was pretty normal until like the odd show and so I remember seeing you and I don't know if it was and a hippodrome years ago singing Scott Allen. I think that's when I first heard you sing. Always. Well, I've got a, a really long history with Scott Allen. Yeah. When he first came over to uh, London, 2006, 2007, yeah. something like that. Um, and it was his first gig and I got asked to do it. I can't remember who even organised it. I just can't remember a damn thing. But I said, yeah, sure. Um, they'd offered me always. And I went, yeah, yeah, not a problem. And um, I said, I'll, I'll start to learn it. And then when he comes over, we'll practice it. So anyway, he came over and we had this rehearsal. And I was the last one of the day to get this rehearsal with Scott. And I was a bit nervous because it was like really early on in my career. And it was Scott and I was singing his music. And I was like, oh, um, and he was going to, yeah, he, I think he was releasing an album and he was doing, um, oh, what was that? What's that shop? Dress Circle. Dress Circle, right? Do you remember yeah. Dress Circle? Yeah, um, and, Yeah, and he was, he was going there to sell his album and he was going to do a little performance and stuff and it was all, you know, um, and, uh, and I, anyway, so that's what he was doing. And we had this rehearsal for this gig that we were putting on the next day. And I did this song and he said, um, will you sing a dress circle for me tomorrow? Uh, I said, yeah, I think so. Sing what? He said, just sing this. I went, yeah, sure, okay. Um, I didn't realise you were doing that. And he went, no, I'm not, no one else is doing it, just you. I went, okay. Oh, it is tight, right? Oh. Yeah. Just the way the lesbians like it. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I went there, I totally went there. <laughs> Hi. 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 She's so pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a little word sheet here. She's so cute. Just give me like that. I'll throw it I 
And anyway, as, as it turns out, he was literally just like, I love her voice. I love her. She, uh, who is this girl? And I sang that song for him. And then I also did the gig for him. And then it became this long love, you know, that I, I love that song. Yeah. And um, and whenever he was over here, he always asked me to do, you know, the gig or whatever he's doing. What, what do you want to come and sing? And, uh, and it's always been always because I love it. And then, of course, um, I actually, someone asked me to sing, one of my really dear friends, Zara, asked me to sing at her wedding while they were signing the register. And I went, yeah, sure. I said, can I do something fun with something? And she went, yeah, we don't have anything specific. Just make it beautiful. You know what I mean? Like make it loving and beautiful. And so I contacted Nick Barstow, the MD that I work with all the time. And I just went, can you mash up always with something? Because I just love it. I've always sang it. It's beautiful in terms of the, the, for the, for a wedding, but I just want it to be a bit different because I've sang it a million times. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do something. He mashed it up with time after time and forward slash then, you know, I had a, more of a journey with Scott Allen because me and Sophie then ended up recording that when we were in Wicked together. It's the most beautiful arrangement. And um, so, yeah, so I've, I've, I've done, I've known Scott for years. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, it was like within a year of me, you know, come getting out of drum school was, was I met up with Scott and, and worked with him. And um, so, yeah, that Hippodrome gig, I remember it. I was like last as well. And I was like 11.40 at night or something. I was like literally midnight. Like I was, I was basically sloshed to hell. I miss that venue. Have you been back since it got re redone? Well, I've seen Magic Mike. <laughs> I haven't yet. How is it? Oh my God, it's unreal. It's, un it's unbelievable. <laughs> no, it's the most ridiculous night of your life. It's just everything you needed to be and more. Um, it says everything it needs to on the tin. It's great. Um, but yeah, it was, no, it's really good. Um, I, I, I haven't, I don't, have they... Darren Bell produced some concerts over Christmas there, Fourth Wall. But is it a different, so is it a different venue to what it used to be? So is Magic Mike just that room now and then it's somewhere else in the building? So basically no is your answer to your question because I haven't, because I clearly don't know where it is. Um, it's the same, it's just so beautifully new seats, new upholstery, new stage. Yeah, yeah, but then, so it's the same, but it's the same room it's as Magic Mike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Okay, well, yeah, it's stunning. I mean, like, it such when they created that venue, it was like, oh my god, everyone wanted to be there because it was just so delicious. It was yeah. so nice, yeah. um, and uh, and obviously, you know, you can then finish the gig and go, you know, a little bed on the, uh, you know, on the craps table. Right why not? So you mentioned Nick Barstow there. How did you first meet Nick? Because you worked together a lot. So this is a good one. So Nick Barstow early young Nick Barstow contacted me for a singing lesson I want a singing yeah. lesson yeah and I went okay yeah sure uh so he came to mine we were doing a singing lesson and then he said uh, and he happened to get into the conversation that he writes his own stuff and I went oh I'd love to hear it sometime and he went well I'll play one now and so he played me this uh, this, <laughs> this song and um and I said, no, I went, that's unbelievable. It's brilliant. Like, it's really, I would love to sing that. And he went, well, funny you should ask. I'm recording a load of my music and I, I really want you to sing this song. So it was all pretense. This was, he did not want to sing a lesson with me. He wanted to get <laughs> into the room with me. So he could Clever. ask me to sing his song. Um, so, and I said, of course I'll sing that song. It's it, like, it's stunning. And I would love to be involved. And he had the, you know, he did it all properly. And we went to a proper studio and he'd done a number of songs from it. And uh, it was kind of like a song cycle. Um, and yeah, I sang this song for him. And from there, I can't remember how the relationship grew, but I just went, he's obviously brilliant and he's young, you know? And it's like one of those things, you're like, get in there now, because when he's like really famous, everyone wants him as an MD, his, you know, he's literally loyal to you first. So that's what I, my, my thought process was. So then when I did like a gig, I said, would you do a gig with me? Um, my and he was like, I'd love to. And then it became that every time I did anything, I went to Nick first. Mm. Um, and the majority of the time, Nick could always do it, and we'll always find time to do it if we can together. Um, so so yeah, it was initially just a singing lesson that he just absolutely lied about. Just got rid of singing the song, but you know, listen, if you don't, you know, props to him for doing it because we might never have met otherwise, or we might have met further down the line. And you know, and he's he's really like Nick is so talented and he's, he's 
he's no I'm so pleased I found him in a way because there's so much of my career is has been because of Nick and I and I also what I enjoy is um it's his, you know he's so good at changing up stuff he's got a musical brain he's not just a great pianist you know which he is he's an unbelievable pianist but he also has like a mind to change stuff up and I love doing that I love changing up songs and making things new and mashing things together and um that creativity I really like I just I'm just terrible at it so um I can't actually do it myself so the fact that Nick can do it and I go yes let's do that I'd love it I love it and then I just sort of sing with him you know we just have a great time so um yeah and he actually lives he's just moved really like really close to me he's like lives five what five minutes away from me now I'm so gonna really um, kind of highly- yeah yeah basically I can't I will never get rid of him now and um We'll never get rid of each other. And and now it's even worse. Cause now I now I know he's two minutes away. So I'm gonna be like, I'm just coming over because I need to run and some music by you. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm gonna use it even more than I did before. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, so you did a charity single very recently. Yeah. With Nick and the lovely um, Emma Lindas. You just call out my name and you know. We've recorded this uh, charity single for Mind, myself, Alice, Emma and Jake. It's one of those songs that really hits home this year. We wouldn't have done it if it hadn't felt like a time when it was really necessary. If you can spare the price of a download, all of the proceeds will be going to Mind, a charity very close to my heart. So please head over to iTunes or Spotify uh, if you can and purchase the single, all proceeds go to mind. We actually, um, when we did intermissions last summer, um, Nick was obviously music uh, director extraordinaire and he, um, I said, just come up with some ideas. If you've got ideas for something, that's great. We need to think of songs that are acutely aware of the current situation, but also, you know, parties so that we feel that we're having fun. Um, So we need those moments. You know, we came up with these moments that we need in the show, you know. And uh, and he said, well, you've got a friend such a, isn't that like bang on? And I went, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it as a trio. Why not? Because let's, because it's like, there's crunchy chords, all galore in that. So let's do it. So he came up with it back then and we sang it. We loved it so much. We, we had in our thoughts and maybe we should release this. And then we just never did. And then December hit and I mean, it was just so hard when like that, that particular, you know, just December just felt like we took 85 steps back as, as a country, uh, but even worse than industry. All these shows were showing signs of life, come from away and booked February concert shows. You know, everything looked like it was coming back the following year with a plum. And within seven, it felt like, well, I think it was actually within seven days, everything just got cut and um, and we went into lockdown again. And we all just really suffered. I mean, I know everyone suffered across the, across the globe, with that uh, across the country with that third lockdown. But I think our industry just felt you know, just like it had been really kicked when it was already really badly down. And... And we had been delayed even further, you know, it, first one of the first things to go, one of the last things to come back, you know. And um, and we felt really, really low. And so I text them just saying, maybe do you think we should release You've Got a Friend? Because right now, I think that's the message that we all kind of need. Because I had noticed online that people were very, people that had been really, upbeat and silly and funny and doing silly things suddenly went quiet and were having moments where they were going just gonna take a couple of days guys you know and um and I was going guys it's affecting everyone now this this is not this is affecting the people that were trying to be the positive people um and so you know I couldn't have quicker have got a yes from the others yeah absolutely when should we do it yeah Jake yeah Jake I'll do it I'll Jake I'll do it you know like yeah mixing when do you want me yeah just I'll work it out everyone just said yes we just did our vocals um all separately all tried to match up and Jake was brilliant as always just smashing them all together and and yeah we just wanted to get a message out there don't worry we're all we're all going through it 
and you've always got someone who understands how you feel, even if you cry because you couldn't find the right milk at Tesco's today. Do you know what I mean? Because that's literally like, the, you know, could be the cat, the straw that broke the camel's back sometimes. It's just something silly like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, it just pushes you over the edge because we're all so worried and anxious and sad. And, um, and it was just that, that was really the reason why we, why we wanted to release it um, to make sure that we sort of said it out loud and we raised money for a great cause, the cause which I think most suits that vibe, that sense of low ebb, which is mind, um, because our mental health is just down. It's down and dumps in it. And we were like, you know, we need to make sure that people know and support those charities that are pretty much helping everyone out the most at the minute. So going back to that, when you when you got that call about the concept version of Come From Away, was that a glimmer of hope? Had you really kind of built yourself up to it or did, were you kind of holding it back just in case it didn't happen? I, I have become, well, maybe I was always this, but this, this year has highlighted it, a realist, yeah? So I, I, I was like, every job I've ever gone up for, you know, if I get a yes, I'm like, I'll, I'll wait to the contract. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm that person. Uh, the concert was, you know, floated. The idea of the See It Come From My Concert was floated earlier than, than it was announced. Like, we we knew a couple of months before. They were like, would you all? Because obviously it was like, would you? Would you all do it? And, of course, we were all like, yeah. Um, got nothing else going on, dear. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Let me so, think about it. Yeah, so, so it was a yes. And then they went, okay, yes, we're going to do it. Because it looked October time quite positive in terms of industry. Things were opening or things were planning to open in November um that you know the infection rate has gone down everything looked like it was going in the right direction in terms of stuff reopening and um and so we were all super like when we got the yeah we're going to do it and we we're all like oh brilliant that's february what a glorious time february would be also really useful because we've all forgotten it so that would be you know an extra sort of you know we got sent the the show um on a desk recording and i was listening to it but i'm just going i have forgotten everything apart from me and the sky like it's the only song that is in my memories me and the sky um so we were met so so you know it was it was buoyant but I did and I did have this well I mean if if we do it yeah. in February um I was happy to do it and I was couldn't wait but I was like everything's an if and a big fat if at the minute you know what I mean then it was actually in December and I think I felt like I had a premonition because I went in to do a gig at um, Ronnie Scott's with my friend CJ Jansen. And um, I came, I, I went in, it was a Saturday afternoon luncheon. And I went in, I did this gig and it was all social distance, brilliant. You know, we all, it was, everything was seating there, perspex in between each table. It was all really well done. I came out of Ronnie Scott's to walk to Charing Cross Station. And I have never seen that many people in central London in my existence. It was yeah. heaving because they were allowed to, uh, A, and B, everyone was desperate to. Um, so I came out and I remember walking all the way and there were so many people. And I, I came home and I sat down and definitely, you're all right. And I said, I think I'm just tired. And, um, and I sat there and I, and I went, no, I'm not tired. I think we're wrecking it. I think we're doing it. I think, I think it's, I think we're screwing it, you know, um, because I said, I've never seen that many people. And I think it's really upset me because I think that's going to, that we're going to blow it. And, uh, and so I was in a bit of a negative place about, yeah, good luck that we get February out of the bag. And of course, you know, the worst, absolutely the worst happened with the variant and then the closing of everything within that week. The second I heard of the spread of the variants, and the closing of, and I was going into like that magical tier four. Do you remember magical tier four that didn't yeah, exist yeah, until yeah. London went into tier four? Um, when we went into that tier four, I went, yeah, let's let's kiss it all goodbye. Let's it's gone. Like February's too close. Like it's too soon. Um, and uh, and you know it was really obvious by the time we went into lockdown that we wouldn't be doing it. Um, and maybe it's a mental sort of like. Um, thing that I do to save myself getting too upset about stuff but I had because I prepared myself from for that for so long that it might not happen I was like it's a shame but I expected it so I can sort of deal with it more um and I think that's maybe a defense mechanism on my part but 
um you know I think I think it, it was it was a shock to, to some and it was you know because everyone was pretty much at home most of the time and suddenly didn't realize that we were going in the really wrong direction um with the virus but yeah it, it was a shame but as I keep saying I would rather everything open in all its glory than trickle in a mess and that you show know. is going to resonate so deeply when it does yeah it's a, it's it's a global catastrophe what we're going through at the minute and that show is about recovering from a global catastrophe you know because because the although it happened specifically in new york 9 11 the world felt it like there wasn't a place there wasn't a city that you didn't feel that in um you know because obviously the images just haunt you you know all we did was watch it for like a week those horrifying images um and what is so and so we all and we know what that feels like to come out of that because we're all experiencing it right now we all know what it feels like what we kind of need which is people to smile at you and say hi which is people to be kind to each other because we've had such a terrible year so everyone just be really nice and what of course come from away shows so perfectly is people being wonderful without uh, desire for recompense or without monetary finance or anything. They're not looking for anything back. They're just giving to be, to be wonderful people. And that's kind of, you know, what we so desperately would like at the minute is for everyone to just think of the other and go, I know we've all had a horrible time, so let's all hold hands, you know what I mean? <laughs> um and and you know be thankful that we're all still here and we've got through it um so yeah it will it will massively resonate um i remember just before we closed there's some there's some comments in it that we even experienced like um there's a line in it where they say you know can we bring can you bring toilet roll to the, the lions club and of course we were going through you know toilet roll gate here where there was no toilet roll to be found because everyone had taken the toilet roll do you remember that in like yeah. april or uh, march Every, like suddenly everyone had just panic bought toilet roll there was nothing on the shelves and um and so we had that line already and everyone was howling at it because they were like oh my god yeah that's that's literally what's happening is <laughs> we haven't got any toilet roll um so yeah so many things will um will marry up to it and um and you know we need a good feel factor show you know story at the minute that's what we that's what we kind of need we need to be moved we want to see something good but we need something where we come out going I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to be a human being. And it's because you see something like that and you know that they exist when you see Come From Away. People like that exist. And it is a juggernaut of a show to do. I mean, you've said that, I think even compared to Wicked, you said that playing Nancy was quite a hard job. But well, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy's, a well Na Nancy's a nightmare because... Um, You've got to do like a sort of like a gravelly, you know, you've got like the voice and it's very alto -y and it's very rough and ready. And, um, you know, on pop, pop, you know, it's like, like that is like rasping your voice. Way worse than Elphaba for me. Oh my God. Vocally, I was like, oh my God, have I got it? I've no idea. Whereas Elphaba literally pang eight, eight times a week. So that was, it's a weird one. Um, I think um, Beverly Bass and, and Come From Away, I suppose I'd, I'd, been through um two years of, of a hard slog so yeah. do you know what I mean like doing a, a really massive role so of course suddenly going into come from away um I did like come from away as a show is so is so much easier to do <laughs> you know what I mean? like there's no running about I'm never really off stage so it's that hour and 40 minutes of the show goes so quickly um because you're constantly there listening watching everyone else um, and moving the odd chair, you know. Um, but some and, of the choreography uh, is tricky. Oh, like, darling, hence, hence why we're all panicking about going back, darling, because <laughs> I, like, honestly, I mean, Al Harvey didn't know it after five weeks of performing it, so God knows where he's going to be when we start off. I always used to just laugh at him because he just used to move things. I had to move them for him because it's just not, that doesn't go there, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Even I know your track. It was like, I was so, oh, we're absolutely panicked panic census about it um because um because it is very accurate and it works because it's accurate do you know yeah. what I mean like it's, it's so perfectly done so you can't really mess it up because then it doesn't really work and you know you're messing it up um so yeah so you know apart from that but I have to say I you know I, I suppose from what I've just come from it, it it feels it's it's lovely um it is 
yeah you do have to really be on it i mean the thing is you've got that you've got that song just before it where they're in the pub and i mean the, the why they did this to paul whoever did it originally because she runs around like an absolute lunatic in that pub scene. She's dancing. She's you know she's running around. Then she does me in the sky. And then she run off and put her jacket on and do me in the sky. So actually, the the doing Elsa for so long really got me used to, you know, running around and then singing a really big song because that's what you, that's mainly the whole track in, in Wicked is that you're running around like an like an idiot and um, and singing aggressively big songs. Um, but I I. No, I love it. And I don't find it, I don't find it exhausting. I mean, I literally did five weeks, so cut to me like two, <laughs> into the run and I might literally can't see. Um, but well, that's you know, I don't, the whole I, lockdown, isn't it? Like I, we're all sat here like willing to be back and back. Cut to next year. We'll sat there and be like, that's too much. I just need a day off. I need like a, a day. I need that year off again. I need that year off. Can we get that year off back? Um, yeah, no, I listen, I'm very thankful that I'm going back and doing Beverly Bass. If they said to me, okay, so we're going back and we're doing Elf, but I <laughs> honestly don't know what I do. I would have a breakdown. I don't know. I can't even imagine it. So I'm absolutely thrilled I'm going back to that. I mean, we'll be tired. We'll be tired. <laughs> um, but because no one is show fit, not one of us no. is show fit. And, um, and we will need to get that back in because no matter what you do, no matter how much you go, maybe running at the minute or do some yoga or, you know, we're not doing eight shows a week and it is in your body to do eight shows a week. You do have to get used to it. So no matter what, oh, we'll all be dead. I mean, don't come and see us like on the matinee of the last, like on the seventh show that week, because I literally, we're going to be pinning our eyes open. Do you know what I mean? Living off coffee um, because we're just not going to be used to it in any way. But that, that, I quite enjoy it for that. I'll quite, I'll laugh. Because just seeing people like absolutely knackered after spending a year and what will be a year and a bit, you know, sitting at home on Zoom. So what have been the positives out of lockdown for you? What have you actually really, do you think you'll take away from this whole experience? I always loved my industry. I always loved performing. I always loved um, being up there creating telling stories doing something new you know I, I loved all of it but I, I didn't realize how much I loved it till it was taken away and I think that's like anything I suppose um, it's like your freedom just you know not being able to go to a restaurant go to a shop go to you know top shop you know look around top shop just because you can so having that taken away it's, you know you don't realize it until it's gone and having it taken away, I think what I realised is I don't feel like I have the purpose. I feel like I'm just surviving and I haven't got my purpose anymore. And um, and so when I, and I think that's what I've acknowledged and I've gone, gosh, without that industry, without you being able to do what you do, you, you've you lost your purpose. And I'm sure if anything ever happened and I needed to, you know, not do it anymore, you would find a separate purpose. But at the minute... My purpose has just been taken for no reason <laughs> that I can do anything about. Um, and uh, and I, yeah, I think I've, I've gained a further appreciation um, for what I do and why I do it, not just to, you know, garner the applause and garner the, you know, ha sit and get to start seeing. I, 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 I miss it because actually who I am is telling stories and doing that work. Um, and I call it work because it is work and I love it. I'm happy that that's my work, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, to not have that any anymore is has been really, uh, as I found really difficult. But it has made me go, oh my god, when you go back, you're gonna, you're gonna feel that again. And I can't wait for that because I feel like I'm lost. Hence why I started doing little bits and pieces like intermissions. Gave me a purpose, you know. It gave me grasps of this purpose back. And um, so I think I have an appreciation for that. Um, and the and the, like the bog standard positives that I've had from it is the gardens never looked as good. It is yes. a gorgeous garden. Everything everything we've ever needed to do in the house is done. Okay, thrilled. Um, and I get to spend so much time with Gavin, my dog, um, yeah. as well Phoebe, who's like thirteen years old now. She's in the twilight years. And um, I'm glad you said it in that order, though. So Gavin does come first. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Probably behind the door listening. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I just said, uh, yeah. I mean, just just being here together and spending so much time together and, and you know, Phoebe at first, when we when we were home 24-7 suddenly, 
she was like really furious about it. She was like, why are you here all the time? I'm normally <laughs> sleeping. Like it's seven o'clock. I'm normally sleeping at seven. And she really was put out. Now, of course, she's the opposite, which is like, if you go out for two seconds, she's like, where are you going? You know, so sort of like panic. Um, but, you know, getting a chance to have that much time together. We're quite newly married. You know, we got married in 2019. And um, to have this much time together and, and you know, and to, to walk Phoebe every day and just enjoy being out and you know nature and you know doing stuff like that it does, that is you know amazing you would never get that time and you don't and you don't get, ever give yourself that time yeah. because you think I must work and I must do this and I must take every opportunity well there is no opportunities you might as well embrace the time and and so that's amazing so you know you have to find the positives where you can and and that and there definitely are some you and Gavin met on dirty rotten scoundrels yeah we played opposite each other. Well, most of the time, anyway. We were we were understudies um, to the to the two lead roles in that. Um, and uh, Gavin went on for ages um, because Rufus Hand left at one point, so he was on in the interim. And um, and I was on, and, and we just yeah, we were always got on really really well. Um, and it was a, that show was just such a great laugh. Uh, did you get to see it? Yeah, I loved it. I'm one of, it's like totally my comedy so that kind of farcical ridiculous have you seen the remake they did the film uh, I watched a bit of it yeah <laughs> <laughs> just a bit of it and then went I don't think this is me um but uh yeah no it's brilliant it was so good and yeah we um we were sort of we weren't really we sort of seeing each other but but saying that you sort of like see each other at shows we were sort of, we weren't really, we sort of seeing each other, but but saying that you sort of like see each other at shows. So that was about yeah. just basically seeing a colleague every day. Um, and then, um, and yeah, and then we used to start going for like, uh, there's a little um, uh, Spanish place opposite the, the Savoy Theatre. And um, it does like tapasy and stuff. And it was always open. And we ended up going there a lot after the shows, having a show and a bottle of red and some tapas. And, uh, and then our love of Spanish and tapas and things uh, arrived and we suddenly realised we meant for each other. So, yeah, we met Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I'm, I met so many lifelong friends on Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Like, it was one of those shows that you get them now and again. And you think you've made all your friends and then suddenly you hit uh, this one show where I just, I met so many, like, I, A, I met my husband, but B, I met these friends that I will never, never, they just won't get rid of me. Um, Cause we just had, I think it was the show as well. We just had such a brilliant time, just laughed like every day. Do you think it's a benefit to have somebody who knows the industry as your partner is able to help you and pick the world for? I think so. I obviously don't really know it the other way. Yeah. Um, but I think it probably does. Yeah. I mean, like he understands it if I'm upset about something or if I'm stressed about something to do with work or the show or if I can't, you know, if, if like seven shows that week and the eighth is like just makes my back break. You know, he gets all of those sort of things, those niggles that sh that the repetitiveness of eight shows a week does. Um, and there's sometimes the melodrama that comes with it because, you know, we're actors. So, you know, we're sometimes melodramatic about stuff. And um, so, you know, the, the other partner gets that and understands maybe where that's coming from. Uh, but then I know couples that have people that one of my dearest friends are has married someone that works in marketing, you know, and it's just they absolutely work. And do you know what's And he also fits so well into yeah. a load of actors, you know, because sometimes you think, oh, you know, it's, it, my partner doesn't get it. You know, he absolutely just fits like that into a group of really stagey people. <laughs> um, my friend Jen, my, my best mate Jen, she's married to, um, he's, he's not in the business side, he never has been, never was, started off as a chef, now works at Gatwick um, and just fits right in with our, with our friends, absolutely. So I don't think it's essential, but there are benefits to understanding what, what we're going through. But you seem quite a private couple. It's not like you drag him on stage as much as... He doesn't like it, really. No. He's, not that, he's not that way inclined. He sort of says, oh, you do that. You know, I, he, he'll, you know he's an actor and he does it, but he, he just says, no, you do, uh, you do your thing. You know, he's just a, a working actor as opposed to a show-off cabaret persona like me. Do you know what I mean? Like, he just loves to sing. Um, yeah, he's not really up for it. He gets all stressed about it. He'd rather have 
four, five weeks rehearsal and then go on, do you know what I mean? Um, but I think that's quite nice. I think that's quite... Um, that's balanced. It means, it, it's balanced, yeah. And if we were both like that, we'd both drive each other insane, I think. Just the amount of gigs we were doing and just, oh, i got to come to that. What are you singing tonight? Oh, God, I've seen that again. Do you, know what I mean? you know, we don't really stress each other out that way because it's one or the other. Well, I meant to ask, so are you... It's not, I'm back home in Cumbria at the moment. You're from Cumbria, aren't you? Yes, darling. Where about Cumbria are you? So we're near Kendall. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I grew up in Colbeck. Do you know where that is? Yes. Down the road. Are, you, really are your parents Colbeck. still there? Yeah. Um, they're not in Colbeck anymore. They're down in Welton, which is on the way to Dalston. Yeah. So if you go through, yeah, so... Um, yeah, they live, in, they live there. They moved, they did move out for a bit, but then they moved back. It drew them back. That, those Cumbrian Hills drew them back. But we owned, if you if you ever go into to Colbeck, we, um, I say the Royal Wheat, it was nothing really to do with me and my parents, but um, we owned a Midtown Care Home, a care home um, oh. in the centre of Colbeck. I was four when they moved there. So, I, and we were there until I was like 17. So, um yeah, and they're still oh. there. They're just down the road now. I've got loads of friends still there, and we've got loads of sort of like um, I don't have much family down there. It's just my mum and dad. But uh, yeah, I I I loved it. It's funny, isn't it? Because when it, I remember things like you know losing power for like four days because there was yeah. too much snow in Colbert. Because like when Col Colbert was cut off, if you didn't have if we had a snowy you know couple of days, C Colbert got cut off. Do you know what I mean? So it was like good luck, guys. Get the generators going. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I loved it. God, I just loved it. I went to school in Carlisle um, oh, in the nice. end. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, nice to grow up in the countryside like that. You, you forget how beautiful it is. It is, it's stunning. I think I'm yeah. going to come back to London if I might. I know, it's very, very different. I mean, look, it's the quiet at night for me. Do you find that? Like here, it's not that quiet. There, it's like, it's... yeah. And, and and just darkness because obviously you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yes, darling, I'm very yes, I'm a Cumbrian through and through. Nice. Anyway, um, I should let you go because we've got more and more meetings to go. Oh. Pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome, darling. Have a great day and I'll see you later. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.